But there's one thing for sure we'll keep opening on Sunday nights. I remember one time there I had a church and I started the church and I got to the church and no one else arrived. Except my musician. And so I said, Let's start singing. And I started leading the chorus in a totally empty congregation. And we started singing and then a couple of people came in, strangers. And then we finished the singing and I started preaching. Then more people came in, they were late, they just kept coming in and coming in. And then out of them were a few musicians came in and joined in the church and away we began. <coughs> we don't count numbers. We should learn that lesson from King David. He counted numbers and what happened? He learned to try, the Bible says, Cursed be the man that trusteth in the arm of flesh. It's not in numbers, but it's our heart relationship with Jesus. All my life I've been so thankful, and I have, just being so thankful to the Lord and what God has done in our lives. Hallelujah, right? Eh? Small in number, but mighty in spirit Amen. and faith. One asked, what a message tonight. Hang on, I've got to find it. I have notes. I love notes. It keeps me on track, otherwise I'd drift off somewhere else. Father, we just want to thank you tonight, Lord. As I just bring this message, I believe it's something to, that you would want me to bring. And Father, I just pray for each and every one tonight that it would touch you, it would impart, and Father, and, and just bring something fresh to them and new, I pray, in Jesus' name. Now, this is nothing, this is just very basic teaching, but it's something we need to hear again and again and again, don't we? You know, in the Gospels where Jesus healed the sick, there's, there's a recurring pattern emerges again and again, where Jesus looked to see if sick people had faith to be healed. As you know, there were so many in instances where Jesus asked them, can you believe that I can do this? Do you have faith before I pray? Can you receive this? Many instances, you can find them yourself through the Gospels, he challenged people, where were you with your faith? Can, can you believe this? But we picked this one up after Ma in Matthew 9, 27. That's the end of... Just going to share, and we pick it up after Jesus had just healed a little girl. A girl, remember when they said she's dead? And he said, "No, she's only sleeping." And when he put the crowd outside, he went in and touched them, their hand, and she arose. When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out, saying, "Son of David, have mercy on me." That's in Matthew nine twenty-seven. In verse twenty-eight, and when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him and Jesus said, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? They said, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes and saying, According to your faith, according to your faith, let this be done to you. So it's according to your agreement. It's according to your truth. It's according to what you have in you. It's something that you have a rule, you have an understanding, there's something that lies within you that you know and you will, will, will receive this healing. So it's something you have. You know, faith is a substance of things hoped for, but he's saying to these people, according to what you have. So do you have what it takes to be healed? He's saying, in a nutshell. See, truth, did they have the truth? That Jesus heals. They must have heard through the meadows and where Jesus was healing and faith comes by hearing the word but when Jesus was preaching there must have something inside of them that heard that Jesus heals from his travellings around because it had something inside of them which said yes I do believe that so they said according to what you believe then see Jesus had all faith in healing power necessary to heal him like that, instantly. But he didn't do that. He waited to hear what they had to say. He, he had determined, did they really indeed have faith? And you know, through the epistles, he challenged people many, many times the same thing. 
Can you believe this? So it's all right for a person to get prayed for, but have they got faith to receive the healing? I've got many instances where I've seen that happen in other churches and that and ministry and that, around other places and that. See, the same pattern is with Apostle Paul, exactly the same, well not quite exactly the same, but much the same. In Acts chapter 14, 8 to 10, in verse 8, he's in Lystra, in Cadesia, in Lystra, and a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting as a cripple from his mother's womb and he never walked. Then the man heard Paul, then the man heard Paul, then the man heard Paul speaking or preaching wherever they were in some synagogue hall or tent wherever they were he heard this man preaching he heard Paul preaching and Paul you've got to don't skim over things just listen Paul observed him intently not casually intently so he looked at his body language he was looking at this man and see he was sort of like he is someone who has had great focus on this man because he said he looked at him intently so he's watching him and as he's preaching and you see something is happening within him something has happened within his man he can see it he can understand it his body language all these different things all together he can see there's something this man's got he's got something as he's preaching but two things which stand out which you all know Paul never prayed for him Paul never, Paul never put his hands on him he didn't touch him See, the man had received something already. He was already in that place. There was no need to whip it up. There was no need to hype it up because he already had what he wanted. He had already was open to receive because he had the truth within him now. And what did Paul do? Paul, Paul said, stand up. And as he stood up, that sealed the healing deal. He stood up, his legs were strong. But there was something within him before that, which was that, that was a catalyst, the catalyst to get him to healing place. There was already something in him where he was feeling the healing power. He was feeling this thing in him. And as he stood up, that sealed the deal that he was healed. But Paul didn't lay his hands on him, didn't even touch him. But what he heard, he heard faith and he, and he received the faith. He probably heard as, heard as well that Paul was p travelling around. But the thing is, it always amazes me that no one, lay, no one laid hands on him. Because he was already in that place. And I've seen that myself in the ministry when we were travelling around. We had an altar call and a woman would, would come out and she's already there. Before we could pray for her, she's bang on the ground. And she received the healing. No one even prayed for her. You can get healed in worship. I've seen that. People come in demonized and other things and no one's touched them and the worship's gone to another level where they're screaming in the service and they're set free. No one prayed for them. No one touched them. It was the anointing that flew and set the captive free by itself. No one touched them. I've seen that. See, Paul had the gift of healing, no doubt. But the healing didn't occur until the lame man had faith to receive the healing. We can say, well, this man had a gift of healing. I've seen this, folks. I've seen it before. I've got a gift of healing, whoever. Okay, that's great. Paul had a gift of healing. But it only occurred when the man was open to receive the healing. In Mark 5, 28 to 30, you know all this. Remember the woman with the issue of blood. She thought, if I can just touch the hem of his garments the tassel if I can just touch it I'll be healed she said and immediately the, blooding, the bleeding stopped and she felt that she was free from the suffering so we know Jesus didn't pray for her he didn't touch her she touched him and the thing is she was walking, she was open, and she was walking in truth and faith now. 
She was open to this thing now. She was really open. She had done everything, remember? She spent all the money and now she's at a place. She probably heard Jesus is healing and he's coming down the road. I want to be at that time he's there because I'm going to get healed tonight. And she had something within her which was the very thing that sucked it out of Jesus, this healing power, because she was ready. Now, she was open to receive from Jesus. He could have walked past and she wouldn't have got anything. But remember, she touched him. She laid hands on him. He didn't touch her. He didn't pray for her. He didn't do anything. He said, who touched me? But the thing is, she was open. She was ready. Ready to receive. And you know, we can be in a prayer line. I'm just saying this. I'm not. I'm, I'm not. I'm only saying this to, to give an understanding. I'm not saying it because I'm big deal, or whatever. I'm just saying this. I was in. I was in Jim Williams Church for a while, and the prayer team and the ministry team, and all that. And I used to see. Used to, you could see things happening, and that people would come up for prayer, and they get prayed prayed for something, and then a week later they'd come back with the same prayer. And it'd go on and on and on. And what they would do is they would find somebody else who was more spiritual or seemed to, seemed to be more anointed than the last person who prayed for them. And then make a beeline for them and they'd get prayer from them again. And then they'd come back and used to hear conversations, oh, it really, it really didn't, didn't work. See, the thing is, it's not who prays for you. It's have you got the faith to receive the re receive what Jesus is doing because people focused on people if I find an anointed man and that's quite right too you, sometimes you do that but the thing is these people kept on getting prayer for the same thing all the time something wrong and what happened was they'd come up for prayer then go back and next week they'd come up to prayer same problem and then they wouldn't get an answer they'd go to somebody a memorial I've seen that who was more anointed than another person. And the thing is, the problem is, they had no faith to receive. They were looking at who would pray for me, what man would pray for me, but they weren't looking at Jesus. They weren't looking, focusing upon Jesus because they should have come with an attitude like, I want my healing. I've come with an well, attitude well, I want my healing. Well, I want tonight or this morning to be healed. I'm eager to be, as a woman with, with the woman of, with the um, issue of blood. She said, I'm open, I'm ready to be healed. I want my healing. And really, it doesn't matter who prays for you then, because you're drawing it out. You're taking it out. You're receiving it. I know, look, I know in the church we have anointed people. I know we have people who are anointed in the gift of healing. Paul was like that. But the thing is, the healing didn't happen until he could, he, he could receive the healing. Could we stop it? Unforgiveness stops it. A lot of things stop it. It doesn't matter how anointed a man is, if there's a problem, it'll stop it. Until we deal with the cause of it. But, in, you know, this is something you all know. In Matthew 13, it talks about Jesus when he came to his own own country, his own people. Yeah. And, and he taught them in the synagogue, remember? Now we're astonished. And I'm not reading, reading for lines. You, you know it all. In Matthew 13, 54 to 58, you, you know it all. But I, you know, I'm just going, is, is this not the carpenter's son? Is not Mary here, the mother? Isn't the brothers, James, Josie and Judas? Aren't they all here with them? And they were offended at him. People get offended at you when they can't understand you. As, as his family did. They couldn't work him out. So they got offended at him. And, you know, the Son of God, the one who, the one who created the universe, who threw the stars in, into heaven, couldn't do much there. He couldn't. He says, I couldn't do much because of the unbelief they had. So that even stopped the Son of God from healing people. That even stopped him from some, some of them not being healed because they got, uh, they got so familiar with Jesus. And so we can get that way as well. We've had prayer before. It didn't work. So we get, yeah, I've done all that. And, and a sad place because they won't get healed like that. You've got to come back to a place again, a fresh new start, and, and come and say, well, Jesus, and get back into the Word and start to get this thing of that Jesus is a healer.
and start to replenish something within them. Because they get to a place to where I've heard it before. Especially older Christians. I've heard this before. I've had prayer before. It didn't work. So they blame the pastor or they blame, but it's probably the condition of their own hearts. Or they haven't got the faith, faith to receive the healing. See, it's not, a, it's not about the amount of faith you have. It's about the revealed truth of faith you have. How much faith do I have? We've got a mustard seed faith. Can do mighty things, Jesus said. You know, as we know, great, doubt is a great defeater of faith. You know, the thing is, I'm going to say that, say that um, I'll skip through a bit. You know, sometimes we go for a problem or something's happening in our life. We've got to exercise our faith. That's the time to start it up. Press the button and let it start to, st start to believe that God will get me out of this problem I'm in. Because sometimes we leave it too late until we're in the problem and we haven't got the Word of God within us and we, we fall apart. So we've got to have the Word resonant within our heart, haven't we? Because when you start to pray or start to prophesy over the problem, the Word comes out of your mouth. Amen. If there's no Word in there, what can the Holy Spirit anoint? It'll only anoint the truth. It won't, it won't anoint my words. It won't anoint your words. It'll only, it'll only anoint the Word of God in you. That's all the Holy Spirit will anoint. It only anoints truth. It won't anoint a lie. It won't anoint my words. What well, Peter said, who cares what Peter said? It's like Jesus said. Yeah. Who cares what men say? What does Jesus say? Because their words will fall to the ground. They have no power and it does nothing. You've got to exercise our faith. And even when the enemy attacks, you know, I've just written a few things down. I don't know if it really gels with this right now, but is when the enemy attacks, we've got to start to believe that Jesus has won the battle for us. You know, in 1 John 3, 8, it says, He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning, sinning from, the, from the beginning. But, but the Son of God came to manifest, to might, to might destroy the works of the devil. In John 3, 8. So Jesus came to destroy the devil's work in our lives. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, said, Be sober, vigilant, for your adversary the devil walks around like he, he not is. He's not a roaring lion, but as a roaring lion. It's just a facade he comes to attack you in. Although I've been through all this, folks. I've been through all of that. The attacks during my early life, the attacks to stunt me, hold me back from moving forward. I've, I've had all that. But one day you've got to get fed up and you've got to start, well, I don't care what happens, I'm going forward. And you have to break through the opposition which comes, comes against you. He's not a roaring lion, it's as a roaring lion. It's not a roaring lion, it's as of one. But Jesus has defunged, defanged his teeth, so he's not going to bite you. I mean, he just comes as an illusion. He comes to bring something, he's so mighty, but he's not. I've been through it. However, remember Apostle John reminds us that the specific reason Jesus came to earth was to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus did that very effectively by his death on the cross, his burial, and his resurrection from the dead, didn't he? As, 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 we, as we celebrated before. So as believers of Jesus Christ, we need to walk in victory because he has secured the victory for us. We, we've got to keep that... We've got to keep back in that place and start to bring it back to ourselves again. When the attack comes, he secured the victory for us. Because he won the victory. We've got to come back to that place when attacks come around about your life. The thing is, we've, we've already won the battle. Over the works of the devil. He's very cunning, but he's very clever. Because it's through the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ who's taken out of, out of darkness and brought us in the kingdom of his dear son. I wrote down this afternoon, Galatians chapter 2 verse 12, it says, Bear with him in baptism which were also raised with him through faith in the workings of God who raised him from the dead. Verse 13, And you being dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, he made alive together with him and has forgiven all our tres trespasses. Verse 14. Having wiped out the handwritings of the corners which were against us, which were contrary to us, having taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So he nailed, he nailed all these things to the cross when he died on the cross. Then he went down, as Pastor David said, down into the heart of the earth 
And then he rose again. And we rose again, didn't we? We died. And we rose again from the dead. We should have newness of life in us. Should be something in us which, it, which is alive, shouldn't it be? If he's alive, shouldn't we be alive? We're not walking dead men, are we? Well, I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, in verse 15, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them over it, in it. So, I mean, when the enemy comes against you, you know, the thing is, we have the victory. But you have to know that. Because I'll show you what happened one day, many years ago, I had an understanding of something, and the devil will watch you. That's what I found one day. The devil will watch you. Hmm. Do you really believe this stuff? And then he watched you. Do you really believe it? And if he can find an access into your life, he will. But he's very cunning. He'll watch you and say, do you really believe this stuff? When you start to wake up, not church people, people who are victorious in him, start to wake up and start to gain ground, then he's grief-stricken. Heaven, hell shakes face when you wake up who you are in him. Yep. Hell starts to quake yes. when you start to wake up that you're men and women of God Amen. and you've given you all authority, all power to stand up on serpents and scorpions. He said, I've given you more power than what the enemy has. Mm -hmm. But it takes a while to get it because he's cunning and he's clever. But the thing is, once you start to wake up who you are, the biggest thing he's got against you, he's going to keep you ignorant. I tell you what, I'm not being funny. More, when I was at work, more blokes in the world knew more spiritual things than what the church did. I couldn't believe it. A couple of blokes at work knew everything about spiritual, not our spirit, but the devil and everything, and I was at work with these blokes. But the thing is, and, and the Christians, not saying here, but other Christians got no idea of spiritual things. It just amazed me. But the thing is, we've got to get to a place where we start to rise up as men and women of God because, you know, the enemy is out to get us. Yes. He never stops. He'll never be your friend. He hates you. Yep. He hates me. He hates the church. So he's always on the attack. But the thing is, if you get the word of God in you, it's a weapon. Yeah. See, warfare, worship is a weapon. It's warfare. Worshiping God is warfare. And we've got to get back to warfare. I remember during the early days, Pastor probably David knows too, most of the songs were warfare songs. We were really fired up. We were really going for it. We were really fired up. We were... Arr! But the problem was with that, was the only problem we had with that was um, you know, evangelist came to the church. He stirred the youth up to a place you got no idea. But when I watched him, because I was catching in those days, and, and the youth were there, and the place was chock a block, and there was people everywhere, and I'm trying to organise catches, and they're falling everywhere, and so oh, don't worry about it. But the thing is, what happened was, is some of the youth were getting angry in the flesh, getting stirred up so much, but it wasn't, they were in the flesh. You know, it's not in the flesh, it's in the spirit. But, but I saw that, the youth getting really aggro and getting angry and at the devil but it, it was and see there are if you do that you're a sitting duck duck for the devil thing is it's in the spirit not in the flesh but that's, but that's what I saw that was the only problem I saw in, in those days they were getting angry in the flesh because they were stirred up so much you know what I mean in those days um, you know it, it says that you know when, when we're in need we've got to come to the place to where we you, you know, you've got to ask what you, what, what, you pray, what you want prayer for. You've got to have some need. We've all got a need in our life, but sometimes you've got to have to be specific. What is the need you have? Because God knows your need, but we've got to know what it is. Because, because remember, many times Jesus asked the blind men at times, who was by, by the maidus, by the road, what do you want? As I said to you, what do you want? He says, I want my sight. So sometimes we've got to, got to be precise with Jesus. But the thing is, what I want to, if, if you want to go to uh, Philippians 4, 6, you all know it. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. It's, you know, it's, it's supplication is something we don't understand. But it's something like, it's, it's something, you come to a broken place. 
You come to a kneeling place. You come to a place in prayer where you humble petition before God. It's a, it's a sincere thanksgiving. It's, it's in a place where you're not rattling all the stuff off. You're in a place where you're, you're, sort of, you're on your knees almost and you're in a place to where you're humbling yourself before God. Lord, this is my need. Not once, but this is my need. And sometimes we've got to get to a place where we... Now, God's not a... As I said before, I, was, I said a couple of while, a while ago, He's not a Coke machine. We don't put a prayer in and get an answer out. He doesn't work that way. If you want to turn to 1 John 5, 14 to 15, might be too much longer. I know we all want to go home tonight. <laughs> you know, 1 John 5, 14 to 15, it says... Now this is the confidence that we have in him if we ask anything according to my will he hears us. No, it doesn't say that. It says according to his will he hears us. See a lot of times we have prayer and it's not according to his will. I, I wrote down, this is not what it says, but I wrote down according to his will in your life. That's what I wrote down anyway. And I don't, don't know if that gels with you, but that's what I wrote down. See, he's doing something in our lives. It's got to be according to what he's doing in your life. According to his will in your life. Because he's taken you on, remember? He's taken you on from glory to glory. So when I start to pray for things, it's got to be according to his will, not my will. See, it says in James 4, 3, it says, You ask, you do not receive because you ask amiss. See, sometimes I've found that it's not what you pray, it's why do you pray it. See, God looks at the underlying thing, thing in your heart. Why are you saying that? Why do you want that for? He looks why you want it. What's the underlying thing in your heart? Is it for you? To help someone? No, no, it's for you. So the thing is, sometimes we can ask amiss because it's not according to his will. It's according to my will and my want and my pleasure. See, the thing is, healing is always according to his will. But the thing is, in other things it's not. It's according to, it, it's according to his will, not my will in, in those different things that I'm going through. See, in verse 15 it says, And if we know that we hear, he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. So we've had the right ingredients now. And our prayers get answered. Because we ask according to his will in our lives. We have the right petitions now. It's not about me, it's about him. Amen. It's not about anything else but Jesus. Amen. It's not about a big house on a mountain and a palatial house over there and a Rolls Royce. It's, it's not about that. It's becoming more Christ-like. Yes. It's not the prosperity doctrine, folks. That's rubbish. It's about being more Christ-like. Because we've been bought with a price. We now belong to him. And we're going along a road where we're transformed into the, his son. That's the plan. That's always been the plan. But unfortunately, some things have come in the church where I can have my best life now. I can have this and I can have that now. But unfortunately, that's, that's connected to Satanism because that's what they say. I want my best life now. So they've taken it out of the Satanist church and put it into the church because that's what the Satanists say. I want my best life now. My best car, my best job. That's what they say. You see, it's not about that. It's about being more Christ-like. Am I becoming more Christ-like? That's the plan. That's the blueprint God had. Be to, more, to be more Christ-like. Do we have the right ingredients sometimes for our prayers to be answered? In Matthew 21, it talks about Jesus leaving... Matthew 21, sorry. Matthew 21, 21 to 22. So after, after, uh, after Jesus leaving the temple where he healed the blind and lame... And he left there and went out to Bethany, and he lodged there. Now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry, and verse 19, and seeing a fig tree by the road, he came and found nothing on it but leaves. I'm not going to say to you, this is very basic teaching, folks. And he, and, he, and he said, and he, and he said, there's no fruit on it, so it withered it away, so he cursed the fig tree, because it wasn't in season. There was only leaves on it. There was no fruit to grow on this ever again. Immediately the fig tree withered away. Verse 20. And when the disciples saw, they marveled, saying, How did 
the fig tree wither away so soon? Verse 21, Jesus answered and said to them, that's the disciples saying to Jesus, and so Jesus answered and said to them, if you have faith and do not doubt, you can not only say to this fig tree, but you can also say to this mountain. I want to say tonight, do you have a mountain in your life? A mountain of debt, a mountain of sickness? You know, mountains, you've got a, if you've got a mountain of cancer, it's a high mountain to cross over, isn't it? You can't see the other side. But the thing is, you know, Jesus said, speak to the mountain. Prophesy to the mountain. I'm not, it's not, it's not blab and grab it. I'm just saying that, you know, we've got to be in a place to where, I've seen this happen where people have done that in their, in their body. They've spoken to it. And I've seen it happen where it's healed, it's gone. One man in the team, he had a big thing out here and he spoke to it, spoke to it. He, he was supposed to go into Logan Hospital and get, a, get, it, get it done off, get it cut off. And over six weeks he spoke to it, he spoke to it, he spoke to it, he spoke to it and it went. So he rang up to Logan Hospital and said, look, look, look I, I'm just done, I want to ring up and say, I can't have the, have the op operation done because Jesus has healed me. But I've seen it happen. Speak to the mountain. Speak to the problem. I'm not saying, I'm not being stupid when I say that either. You know, we go to doctors and all those things. But um, he, spoke to, he spoke to his, he spoke to his uh, elbows out here. He spoke to it and within six weeks it was gone. I had a situation when I was going to work. I had this foot. And in those days I was going by train. So because we only had the one car then. And I had a pain across here when I got up in the morning and it was painful. So I put on my work boots and I'm hobbling down. Um, Lisa, Lisa drove us down to the station. Uh, the kids were still in the bed, uh, bed. We got them up and got them in the car to come down to Kingston Station. So I hop, hopped out of the car and I'm hopping over the overhead bridge to sit on, this, sit on the platform wait for the train. And it was sore, eh? But I prayed for it at home before I left. And it seemed to have got better. I'm giving this as an example. This is what happened to me. And you know, I'm, in, I'm in the train. I'm sitting down now. And the foot's still pretty sore. When I got out, out of the train, Rock Lee, I had to climb over the bridge and go down and start. So I had about a half a mile walk to go. And I got a sore foot. And there's no way back because I don't know what train. Anyway, anyway I, had, I had no phone to ring to Boston, so I'm not coming in today. So I, I'm walking off the train like that. And it's throbbing by this time. And something just in me just said, I said to it, I prayed for you. This is what I did. I'm not saying stupid. I prayed for you. you know, I walked a bit further and I'm still sore. I had no other choice. What am I going to do? And I said, I prayed for you. I prayed for you. I said about six, six, seven times. I prayed for you. And I kept hobbling along. By the time I got to work, it was gone. But I prayed for it, but it came back. Sometimes you've got to fight the good fight of faith. Sometimes you've got to take it to another level and say, no, I've prayed for you. That's, that's what I did and, and I've never had it since. I'm not saying I've done that for everything, but I had no... When you've got no choice, what are you going to do? I can't... I've got to go to work. So that's what I did and I've never had it since. Where am I? What I wanted to say too is that, um, see, Jesus indicating... When he, um, sorry, Luke 17, I got off the track here. But when the apostles, in Luke 17, 5 and 6, the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, pull it by the roots, and if you plant it in the sea, it will obey you. See, without doubting, you can't doubt. Because as James said, if you doubt, you're a wave on the sea, like a candle in the wind. You're sort of, you're sort of, uns and then it does say you're unstable in all your ways, doesn't it? Not just one way. If you haven't got faith, you're unstable in everything you do. He's saying. But then Jesus indicated that more faith is not really the issue. Faith is not measured by the quantity, but by the presence or non-presence. He said, Jesus, saw, he said. Mustard seed size faith will accomplish the impossible things. It's more about obedience, humility, and work with what you already have. When we were in the ministry, we took a couple of blokes out from Pastor Jim's church in a van because I wanted, they, they never did anything. I'm just sharing this, I'm not big noting anything else, but we took them out in the van for a ministry trip. They wanted to come, they never done anything else. And what happened by the end of the weekend, because we used to leave on Friday, so at least would have let me go. 
Um, I, I get home from work, it changed, and it's a long drive. Friday night, but we get a, I get to a place about one o'clock in the morning, and we wake up Saturday morning, and we go to a men's breakfast and back and minister something. Anyway, what happened was, is this bloke's came out with us, a couple of blokes, and um, by the end of the weekend, they're praying for people. And one of them said, how long has this been going on for? We said, oh, about 2,000 years. And they're at the altar praying for people now themselves. Never done it before. So the thing is, you know, it's work with what you have. Because you're saying increase my faith. It, when you work with what, what you have, you get more experience and then your faith grows because you expect more. You expect greater things because you've gone through the minor things. And it grows that way, I think. I don't know, but I think it does. I mean, I've probably got a bit more faith than what I had when I first started. Because you have experiences and things, you think, well, you, you, you go back to probably uh, some monuments you, you've had in your life where God moved in a situation 20 years ago. Then you can draw, you can draw something from that to, to the present day when you're lacking in faith. I remember 20 years ago when I prayed that happened and now you can draw something from that. We don't live in the past but we can go back and draw something from the past right now. And so I remember 20 years ago when you're struggling in faith. That's right, Jesus helped me back then. And you can draw something from it right now. I haven't got much more to go because I know we want to get home. In 1 Corinthians 2, 3 and 5 it says, this is Apostle Paul speaking, he says, My speech and my preaching was not with persuasive words, but of human, of human wisdom, but a demonstrating spirit and power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. So we have to remember the demonstration of the spirit power is, is to build people's faith on God's power, not on man's power, not on man's understanding, on God's power only. Because you've seen it before, you know, I've seen it before, you've seen it before too. It's about God's power. It's not about what man can conjure up. It's, it's not about all these things that men have. Some men are, are great speakers and they really communicate well. I've been in churches like that. It's not about that, Paul said. It's about the power of God. He said, I don't come with a, a, a wonderful speaking. I come with the power of, a demonstration of the power of God. So we have to remember it's not about... It's not about man. It's not about me. It's not about anybody. It's about him. We, we love each other, but at the end of the day, it's all about Jesus. So we have, when we acknowledge our weakness, God's grace comes on us. See, seek God's power. The Holy Spirit can, then the Holy Spirit can, can consider that you'll be a vessel to be used by the gifts. See, faith works by love. The principle of ministry in anything is love. It's not look at me, look at me. It's about the experience that the outpouring of spiritual gifts moves on a person when they move in love. Because love and gifts go together, don't they? You can't have one without the other. If I love someone, I want to set them free, wouldn't I? Right. Amen. Otherwise, if I don't love them, who, who cares? But if I love someone who's bound up, who's demonised, I'd want to set the captive free, wouldn't I? It would be a natural thing that I'd do because I move in love now. And so we've got to go back to the place, do we love God and love people? Because they go together, folks. They dovetail together. You can't have one without the other. Because Jesus said, um, with, with your brother, you see your brother, you can't see, don't see God. How can you, hang on, how can you, don't, how can you see, how can you love God who you cannot see, and yet you don't love your brother who you can see? Something like that, anyway. So the thing is, how can we love God? If we don't love our brother, he's saying in a nutshell. I think that's a sobering thing, isn't it? Some people in the church, I've been in the church, they love God, but I hate him. And the thing is that they're there, so it's just it's vertical and horizontal relationship. Has to be. It's not just vertical, it's reaching out to others. Otherwise, have we really got love? Because he says that's the that's the experiment, that's the test that you are in the faith. It's sobering in one John. If you love one another, you've passed the test. If you love, love God, the Pharisees love God to some extent. They love God, but they hated everybody else. So that wasn't any, that, that was just religion. See, thing has got to be both together. It's got to dovetail together this way and that way. And I'll tell you what, I need a, a, a shot of love in me. I want to get out in the street again. I, I'm not a, 
street evangelist. I'm not. I'm, I'm for the church. I know that because I know that's been prophesied over me. That. But what I do, it's no excuse, but that I can't evangelize. It's not an excuse. I can tell people about Jesus. I can hand out tracts. I can pray for them. I, I used to pray for the people down down the station, and they're very open. Except Australians, they they come for the tunnel off the train. I was there. I said, would you like prayer? Like that? Yeah, I love prayer. And um, a lot of people had prayer down there, which was good. But they're very open down there, but not, not the Australians, unfortunately, at this stage. And we all stopped there anyway. I don't want to say to you, but, you know, we've got to be in a place to where we start to get real with God and see, start to love each other, but then move outside the walls of this church and start to love people out there. Because that's where Jesus spent most of his time, was outside. Anyway, thank you for that. I always love when I hear the story of that woman who said, if I can but touch the hem of his garment. And from, as Pastor Peter pointed out there, from uh, Matthew 9. And she came, and when she saw Jesus, now imagine this firstly. One, she's a woman with a blood issue for 12 years. Two, it was illegal because she was unclean. It was illegal for her to touch any male. Thirdly, she had to weave all the way through the crowd and without touching a male. Now this must have taken some time. After she touches the hem of of the garment of Jesus, he says, daughter of Abraham. That's as close as you get to saying, Christian, daughter of Abraham, your faith has made you whole. But <clears throat> there's something a little bit more about it, and I learned this from some Messianic Jews that I knew, and they came and they spoke for me some years back. And the Messianic Jews have said it is a little bit more than that. He said, on the hem of Jesus, there were these little bubbles on the on the hems of his garment. And she had to come in amongst the crowd and weave her way through the crowd and she had to touch one of those bubbles. But one bubble, one of those bubbles or tussles, tussles or whatever you call them, when you had to there and inside was a purple thread. Now purple was very, very expensive. The, the rich man, as we spoke about this morning, he was dressed in purple. Lydia, she was also a woman with purple. The purple was very, very valuable, more valuable than gold, as a matter of fact. And now she had to come through, touch the hem of his garment, but sort through them until she got to the right one. And then when she got to them, she had to sort through them to find the purple. And once she touched that, found the purple, and she touched it, the Bible tells us that Jesus felt the virtue go out of him. Then he turned to her and said to her, Daughter of Abraham, your faith has made you whole. Now a lot of people saw that. A lot of people saw it. And uh, people saw it and started working, working around and now there was going to be the rising up of a new doctrine. Just touch the hem of his garment and you can be made whole. Just touch the hem of his garment. Because as you saw there in, in uh, Matthew uh, 9, but when you go over to Matthew um, 14, you read again another passage of scripture which says in Matthew 14 and verse 36, when they had crossed over, they came to the land of the Gazarene, and when the men at that place recognised Jesus, the men recognised Jesus because they had seen him previously, they sent out into all that surrounding areas and they brought to him all who were sick and begged him that they might touch the hem of his garment. Now, he didn't want them to touch the hem of his garment. He wanted them to touch his heart. 
Yes. And if he could, they could touch his heart, touching his heart would bring that healing relationship. We have, as I've made up that screed and I've given out many times, 33 ways to be healed. We don't tell God what way we want to be healed. We let God heal us. If you want to limp, put the, place it on touching the hem of his garment, there you miss out on all the other ways to be healed. We don't make a doctrine on what we touch. Our belief is in who touches us. Who touches us, and to me personally, and I love healing, and I've seen so many healings over all of my years of life, I would like to see a, a cripple get into the kingdom of God than a healed person not get in. Yes, amen. A cripple is far more important getting into the kingdom of God and seated upon the throne with Jesus Christ. So the healing doesn't show us who the man is and our relationship. It shows you had an experience in Christ, but that experience is not to become just a doctrine to which you build on, but it's to be built in your relationship with Christ. You've got to learn to come and touch more than the hem of his garment. Touch the heart, the father's heart, the son's heart. And it's in that touching of the heart that melts your heart. Touch it and find the purity that flows from heaven itself. The scribes of Pharisees, they believed in hems and they made long the broad borders of their garments, the hems of their garments, because they thought that made them more popular. No, it doesn't. It is how much do you touch the heart of Jesus and how much you let allow Jesus to touch your heart and change you.